So the experience of today will be nervous tissue. What is nervous tissue? Your nerves. This will mean so much to you guys. Nervous tissue, right? So in a nervous tissue, actually, this is just the basis. So if I were to uh, put it in words, this is the most important thing, like this one right here. Because based on this, we're going to build up for central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, and all this. All we're doing is playing with, you know, cords, electricity, and that's all we're doing. We're sending electrical stimuli through cables. That's all it is. Right? So, nervous tissue. We are going to talk about the nervous tissue and what is the actual functional unit, the smallest functional unit of the nervous tissue. That is known as your neuron. The neuron is what sends the signal. Right? If you want to speak, what do you say? Nothing, you just speak. <laughs> that means there is actually a nerve impulses that travel all the way through the tongue and allow you to manipulate right, a lot of muscle contraction and relaxation, allowing you to vocalization, proper vocalization, not that I do all the time properly. Right? So, so you can actually produce what? Speech, right? Okay. So we're gonna talk about propagation of an action potential. What is an action potential? An action potential is not more than the electrical stimuli that travels along the neuron, right? <clears throat> How many of you have uh, experienced electricity? In the sense of, how many of you have got shocked by 12 volt batteries? No. By a car battery? All right, by a battery. A taser. Okay, that's okay. How many of you have gotten uh, a taste of 120 volts? No. 110 volts? No, that's your house electricity, guys. Yeah. I got shot by 220. 220. All right, we got once. 220? No. 110. Yeah, I get, you know, a 10 is like, 110 has been like five times. So, but that's okay. Right, so that is electricity. Those of you can really now the little shock, right? The two twenty is not to play with because two twenty or two forty can actually kill you, right? Uh, so I give you an event. I was actually uh, that was when I was a kid. I mean, a, a teenager. Uh, it was raining. I was in the pool. I get out. I was want to fix one of those, uh, you know, the, the pool lights. It was off, so I tried like oh, yeah. square, a screw the light. And the back part of the light just stuck in there. Guess what my genius mind did? I get my finger, a little piece of glass. I went like this. Of course, I was wet, right? So I got electrocuted, and that thing took me like about three feet downwards. Like, boom. Three feet down. I was like, oh, my God. Right? Of course, I didn't touch that again. Right? Uh, so imagine, that's 110 plus all wet. Oh, by the way, it was raining too. <laughs> so I don't know how much more that was, right? Yeah, I was part of that time. Yeah, a genius, a genius mind. So we're also going to talk about the conduction of the velocity. So you guys know that from when you think to do something, to do it, it takes what? How long does it take? Say I. How long did it take you? Milliseconds, right? Not even a second. So that is the actual what? Velocity. So. Velocity means is the speed that that electrical impulse is going to travel down, right? Down the neuron. Synapsis is actually communications between one neuron to the next neuron, right? You can have a neuron that is on your brain, it's in the brain, and that neuron connects to the spinal cord. And the spinal cord, there is a connection with a second neuron, and that neuron travels in the spinal cord all the way down to your sacrum, right? Then. At the level of the sacrum, there's another neuron that comes out to your leg, right? So that's another what? Synapses. So you can have multiple synapses within your body. In your brain, you have millions and millions, billions of synapses, okay? So the next one is axoplasmic transport. Axon is a portion of the neuron. Plasma is the cytoplasm of a cell, right? And transport is what is moving within that part of the neuron. So in other words, whatever is transporting up or down that axon or that portion of the neuron. And then neurotransmitters, the word tells you what is a neurotransmitter? Is a transmitter 
of a neuron. What is a transmitter? Can somebody tell me in their own words what is the definition of a transmitter? What is a transmitter? Transmits the message. Transmits, right? Transmit the message, relays the message, right? So that's a transmitter. In other words, is a chemical, a molecule that sends the information from the neuron to the next neuron or from the neuron to the muscle like we saw before, right? Acetylcholine, epinephrine, those were examples of neurotransmitters, right? So those are the ones. So nervous system is the master of controlling all communicating systems in the body. What is nervous system? Well, nervous system, it's regulated by what? So your nervous system is divided into central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. CNS and PNS. Your central nervous system, you think about the word center, what is the center of you? What makes the decision for you? Brain. Your brain. So the central nervous system is divided into two things, your brain and your spinal cord, okay? What is peripheral nervous system? Everything else, okay? So your command center, number one command center is your brain, right? Now, on the periphery, we're gonna have a lot of what? Sensory input. Now, sensory input is whatever is perceived by your body. So a sensory input means receive information from millions of what? Receptors that monitor what? You got a lot of things to monitor, all right? What do you monitor? Temperature. Temperature. Breathing. Breathing, which is a respiratory rate. Chemicals, because how do you control breathing? Your body knows how much oxygen and CO2 is in there, right? So your body regulates how much times you breathe in, how much time you breathe out, based on the amount of oxygen and CO2 you have. So, temperature, chemicals, pressure, do you regulate pressure, blood pressure? Is your blood pressure always high, low? How's your blood pressure? It depends on your life and your activity. It's supposed to be normal, right? And it depends on the activity. It varies. So your body regulates your blood pressure too, right? It also, what else does it regulate? That's it. That's your digestion, it also regulates what things? Sleep. Your sleep cycle, right? You don't want to wake up, you know when to go to sleep, why? Your body tells you. Uh, what other receptors do you have? You see, you what? Hear, you taste, and you smell, and you touch. What makes you special? Your special senses. Imagine a life without being able or feeling the touch of something or someone else. Imagine a life like that. It would be awkward, right? You'd be like spaced out, right? Like you're dreaming and seeing everything on the on the, on the 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 bottom, right? Imagine a life without being able to hear. I mean, most of us don't listen, but hearing, <laughs> right? Imagine living a life without being able to smell. Can you imagine something like that? You cannot? Yes, you can. Have you ever had a stuffy nose before? Have you ever had the flu? Yeah. When you taste the food, it tastes what? Bland. Awkward, right? It's just like, it's, you tasting it, and you put more things in there, and it still doesn't taste, right? So, because smell and taste is together. It amplifies that perception. So imagine a life without being able to taste anything, right? So those are your special senses. Now, we're also gonna talk about what? Integration. What are we integrating? We are integrating all the processes, all this perception that we're receiving, all this sensory input that we're getting, that is all integrated where? Who is the one that integrates every single information and dictates what to do next? Your brain. Your brain. So your brain perceives things from the environment, right? For all that sensory inputs that you have, because you have pain, touch, and temperature in your whole skin, right, your whole body. So, check this out. 
I'm pretty sure that you never thought about feeling the touch of your clothes on your skin. Feel it. Think about how is the clothing touching your skin and where do you feel it the most? Just concentrate. Can you feel it? Yes, you can. Do you do that all the time? No, no because your central nervous system is capable of doing what? A constant stimuli that is there, it gets to a point that it does what to it? It removes it, right? It removes that stimuli. But you are perceiving information, hundreds of thousands of information or sensory perceptions is that you are, our central nervous system is doing what? Focusing, right? Concentrating. So those of you that said you cannot concentrate, that's a lot. Because you do it. If you were to think and pay attention to everything that surrounds you, you won't be able to even speak. Because to speak, you have to do what first? You gotta think, right? If you speak, you say anything, whatever comes to mind, blah, 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 just like that. Well, sometimes, right? But do you have something on the back of your hand, right? Back of your head saying something, right? That what you wanna say, an idea. You don't know what you're gonna say, but there's an idea behind it, right? Or at least there's an emotion that promotes that, right? Okay. So that is the integration of uh, sensation, right? Of, of information. So motor output. Motor output is you perceive this information and your brain decides, okay, is it okay for me to say something or is it okay for me not to say something? Let's say, for example, uh, I don't know, you feel cold right now. Do you say out loud, I'm cold? No. no you because you think that what? That is an improper what? Behavior. Because that's what they told you. I don't know who said that, but anyway, <laughs> right? Now, that is you doing what? Inhibiting, preventing a motor output. What do you mean motor output? I believe that when you speak, there's motor in it, right? Yeah. I believe that when you shake, there's motor in it, right? I believe when every time you move something in your body, even breathing, there is motor in it. So every time you perceive an information, that information that is entering your body through your skin or your central nervous system, right, uh, to your special senses, that is known as what? Sensory. You interpret the information in your brain and then your brain decides whether to send any stimuli out. That stimuli out or that response is what? Motor, always. So. Sensory in, motor, out, if you let it, okay? How many of you are confused? Good. So, anatomical division of the nervous system, here we go. So what is central nervous system? Central nervous system contains the brain and your spinal cord. Now, since that is the center and that is the most important part, do you want to have it naked so everybody can see it and touch it? No, that's my stuff. So you take care of it, right? You protect it. So how do you protect it? By putting bones around it, like your skull, it protects your brain. Your vertebra, column, protects your spinal cord. By putting muscles, by putting a skin, by putting a bunch of receptors that tells you there is pain before that even gets close to my brain or spinal cord. Does that make sense? So that's way of protection, right? You also have in there your CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, C-S-F. And that is a fluid that your brain and your spinal cord are surrounded by that fluid. And that fluid kind of like makes it floating, right? They're not truly floating, but they're in that water medium, okay? Now, in there, in the central nervous system, these are just terms, you have something known as nucleus. What is a nucleus, if you hear the word nucleus? It is a neuron or cell bodies. What is that track? Because you're going to talk about tracks. You guys know what a track is, right? It was a track. Like a train track? Like a train track? What else? What was the other track? Give me another example of track. Okay, the train goes in tracks. Okay, I get that. Do you run a track? Do you run a mile? Do you follow a path, right? It's another synonym, right? So it's a path, it's a way, right? That's what a track means. So a track is a bundle of nerves, what? Fibers. So what are bundles of nerve fibers? It's just neurons that have axons, 
and they travel all up. Like for example, two of these cables together, if I put it this way, it forms a track. If I put it this way, it forms another track. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's, that's all you have. All right. So again, these are actually happening where? On the central nervous system. So let's compare a little bit. What is peripheral nervous system? Anything that is on the periphery, right? You're gonna have a bunch of ganglias. So instead of having nucleus, we're gonna call it what? Ganglions. What are ganglions? The same thing as nucleus. Wait, I'm confused. Well, ganglions are the same thing as nucleus, but they are on the periphery, right? So they're neuron cell bodies. Look, do you see it? They're both the same thing. It's just that ones are in the central nervous system and the ones are what? On the periphery. So you're gonna hear from me saying preganglionic, postganglionic. Preganglionic is what? Presynaptic. What is presynaptic? Before the synapse. What is postsynaptic? After the synapse. What is preganglionic? Before the ganglion. What is <coughs> uh, postganglionic? After the ganglion. So you're gonna have the same thing here, but instead of track, we're gonna call it what? Nerves. And these nerves are gonna be the periphery, and they're going to be grabbed. Uh, most of them, or some of them, tend to be grabbed, oh, not grabbed, wrapped around what? Uh, around something known as myelin sheath. What is myelin sheath? Uh, myelin sheath is actually made out of cholesterol, fat. So those of you that think the fat is bad for you, you're so wrong. Why? Because without fat, you got no hormones. Almost all the hormones that you have in your body is made out of fat, all right? They're lipid-based hormones. Now, without fat, there's no myelin sheath. And myelin sheath is simple as this. If there were to send electricity through these cables and I were to grab the cables on the outside, would I get electrocuted? No, because it's the insulation, like he said, right? The plastic. So the myelin sheath works as a what? As that wrap. Right? It insulates it. And by insulation means what? The electricity does not get uh, deviated by anything that touches. It actually goes straight all the way out. Does that make sense? So it makes that electrical impulse a lot faster. Okay, so you can have a really long cable, it will be fast, right? Now, this information is carried by what? By nerves that connects to the brain and is carried by what? Spinal nerve that connects to the spinal cord. So we are also going to talk about cranial nerves, and we're going to talk about what? Spinal nerves. So cranial nerves, where are they located? On the cranium in your brain, right? And spinal nerves are located where? To your spine, okay? So here's a really simple event. <clears throat> so overview of the central nervous system. There is a receptor, right, which is in your eye. You are thirsty. You look at that glass of water. What do you see? A glass of water. You're thirsty. What do you think? So that's a sensory information that is sending the information as an input all the way to your brain who processes the information, correct? And then your brain will make a decision. Okay, so you got a sensory input and your brain, okay, I'm thirsty. What are you gonna do to the glass of water? Drink it. Now the question is, you send a stimulate down, so then what? Can you drink it virtually out of Bluetooth? How do you do it? You grab it. You can. So you gotta send a motor output, and that motor output or that motor event is a downward event that is going to stimulate your muscles to contract and relax a series of muscles so you can get that water and drink it. Does that make sense? So sensory input, sensory output, right? So input and output is always motor. Input is always? Sensory. Sensory. Output is always? Or input? Sensory. Output? Sensory. Awesome. Now, let's change the event. I like to play. So let's play. So you're thirsty. You haven't drank water in, I don't know, when do you get thirsty? About how many hours? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. No, no, give me something more. Two hours Depending on what I okay, let's see. You haven't drank water in about 8 to 12 hours. You're really thirsty? Okay? Now, I put that glass of water and see, and you're going to think about this, right? What do you see here? 
You see there only a piece of wood and then a water, correct? What about if I start adding things like this? Spider? I don't know. Cucaracha. Cucaracha, spider, Cucaracha. you know, a snake, right? Flies, whatever, right? A butterfly, whatever. Is so, the water? no, 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 around the water. Okay. How many of you would drink the water? 12 hours without drinking. No. Yeah. Two, three, four, five. Okay. Huh? 12 hours without. You don't. Snake? You don't care. Okay. Now, some of you may not drink the water. Why? Because the roots could have been in the water. The snake could have been in the water. It can be in the water, and the water's contaminated, right? Yeah. Now, what do you think? I may do what? I may die if I drink that water. Or I get sick. The question is, your brain will say, where are you at the moment? Are you in the middle of the forest? If you're in the middle of the forest, would you drink the water? Yeah. No. No? Yeah. <laughs> There's no lake yeah. within the next 10 miles. You're going to drink it. You drink, it. drink the water. <laughs> Most likely, you drink the water. And you eat the snake. <laughs> and you make soup out of the roaches. <laughs> Again, guys, how many of you have been without eating for 24 hours? How does it feel? Terrible. What did you eat la the, the next time? Whatever. Whatever was there, right? <laughs> imagine having, or imagine being three days without eating anything. Ooh. What would you eat? Nothing. Very <laughs> right? So it's all about what? It's Thought process, right? It's information, like, you know, naked and afraid. That's what I want to get there, right? <laughs> so it's information processing. Sometimes you do things that you don't want to do, and it's just because the events, right? The situation that you are in life. But again, who makes the decision? Oops, central nervous system, right? Okay, great, awesome. So, you see this right here? Okay. And to describe it to you, and we're gonna go from there. So, what is this? Anatomical division of the central nervous system, right? Ready? So, nervous system is divided into Central and peripheral. Central is brain and your spinal cord. What is periphery? Everything else. What is everything else? Everything else is a lot. So everything else means what? On the periphery, which is the rest of your body, it's your motor or sensory neurons. Wait, does that mean that I have motor? Well, I believe you can move different parts of your body, right? Now, do you perceive from your body? Yes, and body is called what? Soma. Soma means body. Soma? Body. body. Right? Now, in the motor neuron, you have somatic or autonomic. Somatic means what? Voluntary. Because soma means body. Can you regulate what your body do? What your body does? Can you regulate that? No. Close your eyes. Stick your tongue out. Say cheese. Yeah. Right? You can do whatever you want with your body. Skeletal muscles. You have full control over your skeletal muscles. So that one is known as what? Somatic nervous system. That is voluntary control. You have the will of moving things. Right? Now the next one is the autonomic. What is autonomic? Autonomic, the way I remember this one is automatic. How many of you have a car that is automatic? You put it on drive, right? Or you put the knob on D, or you say, hey, something, and then it drives. I don't know. I don't know, but yeah, and then it drives, right? It actually changes the gears by itself. It tells you, it actually knows when you stop, it breaks down, it breaks and takes the gears back. When you accelerate, it puts the gears up, right? That's automatic. Now, this is known as autonomic, means it does it by itself. That means your body auto-regulates. You don't have to be on top of it all the time. So the autonomic nervous system is a involuntary control. It does it automatically. Now, how does your body know when to regulate things? How does your body know when to increase your heart rate or to decrease your heart rate? Let's say uh, I throw a snake on you. Oh, yeah. 
or a spider, or I don't know, whatever. What, what do you like? Whatever you don't like, right? Or I, I throw a back grid on you, and what is your response? Bring danger. Like Courtney, you don't like something, or he's angry. Okay, anyway. So you increase your heart rate. If it's you start jumping or working out, how happens to your heart rate? Increases. Does it increase because you tell them, hey, heart rate, increase? No, it just increases by itself, right? When you stop working out, what happens to the heart rate? It decreases little by little, right? And that is autonomic. Now, that is regulated by both sympathetic and parasympathetic. What is sympathetic? This is fight or flight. In fight or flight, what do you do? Fight or flight. You either fight or you run, right? <laughs> so, I don't know what you do in a stress situation, right? It depends. So if you see a dog in front of you, the dog is unleashed, it looks like it has rabies, are you? What do you do? Do you fight the dog or do you run the dog? We don't know yet. She runs. You gotta look it straight in my eyes. Understand that the dog runs faster than you. So I don't know what you're gonna do. You gotta look it straight in the eye and show him. And say, good boy, good boy. That you're the alpha. Yes, agreed, agreed. So, now, the fight or flight situation, that is a stress event, right? How does your heart rate when you see a tiger? Forget a dog, oh. I love dogs. I see a dog that's like, just look at them, it's like. Oh, so, a tiger, all right, or a lion. What do you do with a fight or flight? What happens to your respiration? Oh. Tell me, how do you feel? You don't like lions? Okay, let's jump out of 30,000 feet on the air. You got no parachute. Yeah. How does your heart rate? Yeah. Your heart rate slows down? You don't feel your heart? No. If you're falling, how's your heart rate? Yeah. <laughs> you're scared right now. So your heart rate goes up. How does your respiration? Guys, imagine a stressful event. How do you breathe when you're stressed? Quick. You hyperventilate. So your heart rate increases, you hyperventilate, right? And do you go to the bathroom when you're nervous? You don't even remember that you need to go to pee pee or poo poo, right? Do you get hungry? What happens to your GI tract? Your GI, you don't feel like you're hungry. You can spend a whole day without eating. You don't feel you're hungry because it is too stressful day. That is fight or flight. You just described to me what happens to you every single day without learning any of the things that I'm telling you. Because this is your body. All these things are happening in your body. So you can get this right. Now, the next one is parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is the opposite. I think about it like me going to bed at home, chilling, relaxing, watching a movie, eating some popcorn, right? Not a horror movie, right? Just a relax, like a funny movie or something like that. So that's a rest or digest. That means that when you're resting or digesting, how's your heart rate? It's, it's down, right? Unless you're eating puckfish, right? Which is the venomous one, right? Your heart rate should be low, right? How is your digestion? You're digesting the food because you're eating it, right? So how is your respiration? <gasps> oh my God, I'm so stuffed. <sighs> right? So, again, that is autonomic is regulated by what? Sympathetic and parasympathetic. Everybody got that? And then the last one is sensory input, right? So sensory is pretty much perceived on your organs all the way to the center of the system. So open your eyes, look at the board, take a shot, screenshot, with your mental screenshot. Open your eyes, close it. Kid you not, you're gonna use this for now, on to the end of the semester and next semester. That's how important this thing is. Pictures, you can take as many as you want. You want to be able to do, put the picture where? When you do this five or six times, to me it takes me about five, ten times, depends how stressful I am. The more stressed, the faster I get it. But that picture, it tells you where we're going to be. In other words, we're going to talk about the brain. There's another chapter about the spinal cord. There's another chapter about the somatic nervous system. There's another chapter about the autonomic nervous system. So everything, it's in there, okay? So, so you're aware. Always keep this picture with you every time we do the lecture so you know where we are, okay? 
So the next one is the spinal cord segment. All right, so in the spinal cord, uh, again, you have the brain and the spinal cord. So what is the function of having a spinal cord? Because that is the one that connects the brain to the rest of the body. So how do we connect the brain to our peripheral nervous system? So how do you connect the brain to our peripheral nervous system, spinal cord? So we said that there are two things that happen there. Either when you perceive things, they move up. Sensory, all the way to the brain. Whenever you dictate what's gonna happen, you send the impulse downward to your spinal cord, out, and then you move a muscle. So far, so good? So the mediator of this is the spinal cord. Everything that comes up, everything that goes down, must go through your, or almost all the time goes through your spinal cord, correct? Now, on the spinal cord, there's a ascending tracks. What are ascending tracks? The one that comes up. Up where? These are known as sensory. And they are descending tracks. These are tracks that go from your brain to the motor, right? The neuromuscular junction to your muscles. It tells your muscles to move. Okay? Now, on the ascending tracks, there are three different main that three main types, right? There are more than that. So you have dorsal columns. These are extremely hard. Why? Because the word is dorsal. What is dorsal? Anything that is where? On the back. So dorsal columns, you know they're found where? Dorsal. All right? So these dorsal columns are mainly for what? Deep touch, vibration, and proprioception. What is deep touch? Remember in the skin you have pain, touch, and temperature? And that touch, it was light or deep touch. The Meisner's and Pacinians, which Pacinians were the deep touch. So whenever somebody pokes you, that information is picked up by your skin, right? But it travels all the way up through your spinal cord through the dorsal root ganglia. That's deep touch. What is vibration? Do you feel vibration? There's a song really from the 60s or 70s. Feel vibration. I don't know, something like that. Yeah. If you actually feel the vibration, right? So that's the vibration sensation. Now, proprioception. What is proprioception? It's kind of abstract, but it's proprioception. Propio means what? What is, I, I think it is Spanish. So proprioception is you have the ability to know your self-awareness of what your body is. Okay. Right? Is that like pain? Like awareness. That is your awareness. I need a guinea pig. One guinea pig. Okay. Guinea pig one. Okay. Use the class. Close your eyes. Okay. So we're gonna demonstrate proprioception, all right? So it's not gonna feel anything that I do on the side, right? But guess what? Where is your left hand? No, no. Up, down, you guys describe oh, to me. Ah. Actually, where's your left hand? Right, now hold on, put it down. Okay. <laughs> where did you feel something? Um, my feet. Which one, right or left? Right. Okay. Where is your right hand? Right here. Okay. What is right here? You gotta describe oh, it. Oh, my wrist. <laughs> your wrist, your right is your wrist? Yes, yes, we know. But where? To the right, to the left, up, down? Oh, I moved up. Okay. okay. Where is your hand now? On my nose. You got it. So, she has, yeah, you're good. Oh, so okay. she has her eyes closed, right? But she was able to feel what? The position of her body. So that's proprioception is that you feel every single tendon, ligament, right, in your joints that you have, you have receptors. And these receptors tells you the movement or the position of your body. If I were to put you like squatting, you would tell me, oh, I'm squatting right now, right? Because you know without me telling you. So those are receptors built in within the muscles, tendons, and ligaments that allows you to feel or be aware of what your body joints and movements are. That is proprioception. You got that? When you're drunk, what happens to proprioception? <laughs> Depends how much drinking you have, right? Because I remember going to bed, but I don't know which bed was done. All right, so then you have the lateral spinal thalamic tract, right? So the lateral spinal thalamic tract, it tells you, right, is where? Lateral. Laterally, right, it's on the side. So the lateral spinal thalamic tract deals with what? Pain and? Temperature. 
temperature. That means is by any chance there is a lesion on the spinal cord on the side here, then that person can no longer feel what? Pain or temperature from that side below. Wait, that side up, yes. Wait, Does that make sense? Yeah. Let's say for example, pain on your toe, right? Okay. You feel it all the way here, but if the lateral side is damaged, then you won't feel from the bottom, but you feel from top because this is the damage. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because every time it connects up, you have different ways of connecting, right? This, this is not just the spinal cord, it's just the spinal cord has different segments, right? What are the parts of the spinal cord? Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, right? So at each different section, you have different pain, touch, sensations, all these things that's coming in. Again, imagine the body as multiple cables like you saw here. So if you were to damage the spinal cord here, then that means that anything from here down you won't feel, but from this section up, you can feel it. Does that make sense? And then you have ventral spinal thalamic tract. The ventral one, again, is on the front, and this is basically for what? Light touch, okay? Now, on the motor aspect, you have a lateral cortical spinal, and it tells you what it is. What is cortical? Your cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex is on the brain, spinal tract. So cortical spinal tract means that it goes Remember, where's the motor starts? In your brain, right? And it goes the way down. So cortical spinal is on the surface of the brain down to your spine. So that's the name of cortical spinal tract, okay? And then you have another one which is called ventral, which is on the front, cortical spinal tract. Again, all these are voluntary controls. Let me give you a summary of this. So you see this, date, Dave became my favorite or my, one of my best friends. I have two best friends. One is Aldo and the other one is Dave. This is one of my best ones. But Dave for anatomy one is awesome. He does a pretty good job. Dave means what? D for dorsal, A for afferent. So anything that is on the back of the spinal cord has what type of tracks? Afferent. Afferent. What is afferent? Afferent tracks are what? Ascending tracks, right? Now, VE, ventral, is what? Efferent, right, or efferent. These ones are the descending tracks. Does that make sense? So if you ever hear the word afferent, is ascending tracks, right? Sensory. So three words, right? If I, you hear the word efferent, is what? The sending tracks are what? Sensory or motor? So the signal, right? So you please know that. Now, normally, how does your body put this in perspective? So how does it actually structurize it? Within your spinal cord, you have neuronal axons. So you have a multiple amounts of what? Axons. Imagine this is the axon of one neur neuron. Then the axons are put in what? Tracks. So now you have two or three, which is a track. And now I have multiple, this is another track, multiple tracks bundled into one big thing that is known as a what? A column. So that's the structure, right? It's one within one. It's kind of like the Russian dolls. Have you ever seen the Russian dolls? Yeah. The little ones that put one thing inside the other one. I'm about drawing, but oh, the Russian dolls, yeah. you open them up, you put it in. That was a quick sketch, yeah, come on. That? There you go, that's a Russian doll. Here you go, guys, we got a Russian doll, right? So you open them up, put in one inside the other one. That's pretty much how, how it is, right? So peripheral nervous system, right? You have sensory, which is what? Afferent and motor, which is what? Efferent, okay? So far is good? All right, so you have for both somatic and visceral. What does that mean? We said somatic is what? Body. Body. Wait, do you feel 
Do you perceive something from the outside of your body? Oh, like, like wind? Yes. yes. Sun, you feel temperature. Yeah. Do you feel something from outside of your body? Yeah. Oh. He does. He's alive. Right. <laughs> what about the inside? Yeah. Yes. Do you feel your intestines yeah. and your heart? Your stomach ache. Do you feel your stomach when you're hungry? Yeah. Yes. yes. So that means viscerous. So inside your body, all those organs, we call it viscerous. So you have both a somatic and a visceral. Do you feel when you have a gas and you can get out away from the gas? It's stuck with you and you're like, oh my God, I have a crap, right? So that is pain. I mean, the worst thing is having fecal impaction and having a gas and you cannot get out. It's the worst pain ever. Right? And of course, from the perforated ulcer. Now, the other one is motor. Do you have control motor on your soma, on your body? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, you have skeletal muscles, right? Uh, what about in your viscerous? Can you move your viscerous? No. Can you say, stomach move? No. Intestines move? I don't know how to do that. But anyway, <laughs> no, you cannot, but do they move? Oh wait, so you have no control of it, but they move. Yes. Okay, so what is autonomic? So that's part of the autonomic nervous system. Make sense? So you have both motor outside, which is voluntary, and then you have motor inside, which is involuntary, that's controlled by your autonomic nervous system. Okay? Awesome. So let's connect the brain with the peripheral nervous system. So in this graph, we have your central nervous system, which is again your brain and spinal cord, okay? And then you have peripheral nervous system. Periphery, we got sensory, right? Sensory means being able to perceive something, you need to have what? A receptor, right? So that chemical, let's say when you smell something, that needs to bind to a receptor. And that receptor sends a sensory information all the way to your spinal cord and your brain. For example, of your heart. If you have your heart rate is increased, then that is autonomic because you cannot control your heart. But it sends a sensory information all the way up to the pons, amedulla oblongata, into your what? To your brain. Then your brain said, okay, if the heart is high, what am I gonna do to the heart rate? Decrease it. If it's low, what am I gonna do? Increase it, just to maintain so I can live, correct? A homeostasis. When we looked at a perception of pain, touch, and temperature, right? We perceive it where? On your skin. Or proprioception. On your muscles. So you send that sensory information. But again, these are longers, right? Like your skin is longer. So this one, before it binds to the spinal cord, is going to make a connection, a synapse. And that can be at the level of the ganglia. Remember the ganglions? The neurons, right? The cell, the cell uh, mass, the cell neurons. So the ganglion is, they can be whatever is before the ganglion, we're gonna call it preganglionic. And after the ganglion, we're gonna call it what? Postganglionic. Does that make sense? Or for sensory, they like to call it the following. They like to call it in order. So first order, second order, third order. So which one is preganglionic? First order. First order. Which one is postganglionic? Second order. Which one is third order? In your brain. So sensory can be first, first, first neuron for first synapse, second synapse, and last synapse. That's for sensory. First, second, and third order. You guys follow? All you're doing is connecting cables. That's all it is. Any questions so far? All right. For motor, the motor is divided into what? So, oh, come on. So for motor, you have motor, where does motor start? In your periphery or in your brain? In your brain. So where's the motor start? In the brain. So. The brain is going to have upper motor versus what? Lower motor. Upper motor is in your, within the brain. And lower motor will be where? 
from your spinal cord down. So an upper motor neuron is upper, all the way to your spinal cord, and from the spinal cord to the periphery of your body is gonna be what? Lower motor, motor neuron. Everybody got that? Okay. So let, let me make this easier, right? I'm gonna separate it. So for sensory, right, we have primary, secondary, and tertiary order, right? The primary is the preganglionic. The secondary are the postganglionic. And the tertiary is within your brain. So far so good? That's sensory. For the motor, I'm sorry, all sensory are what? Afferent or efferent fibers? A. A. It was da, right? Dorsal afferent for Dave. Now, for motor, are what? Motor are either upper motor neurons or lower motor neurons. Upper motor neuron means you're what? Brain to a spinal cord. The lower motor neuron is? They use the proper one, somatic. It means your peripheral nervous system. Does that make sense? The rest of the body. Now, what is motor? What tracks? BE, right? Ventral efferent fibers, right? These efferent fibers are descending, while the sensories are ascending. If you got that, that's about 85% of the most complicated wording that you already figured it out on these things. Any questions before I move forward? Do you get the wording? Do you want me to go over again? No. Okay, awesome. So I'm not gonna go over this one. This is pretty much the same thing. Well, you know what? I'm gonna go over this one real quick. So central nervous system, right? Again, is connected with your peripheral nervous system, which of course you got your cranial nerves and they are going to way communicate into whatever your input is and your input is always going to be what sensory and the sensory can be somatic and or visceral right the outside or the inside of your body you perceive this information you interpret the information you process the information in your brain and you make a decision to do what to send a stimuli that stimuli or that effect is going to travel down the motor efferent fibers and that's going to be through the motor nerves, right? That's a motor output. That motor output is going to be automatically controlled or voluntary or involuntary, right? So voluntary control will be what? <coughs> your skeletal muscles. Your involuntary control will be what? Your autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system will control what? Will be controlled by sympathetic or Parasympathetic actions. Now, a sympathetic is fight or flight. A parasympathetic is rest or digest, right? <clears throat> so let's go into the histology of the neural nervous tissue. That's an overview of what your nervous system was. Now, the smallest structure and functional unit of your nervous system is your? You got it. Now, neurons, and I will love to share a video with you guys. Uh, it's about how much uh, percentage of brain mass do you use? Yeah. So, most of us, right, we heard that humans, regular humans, only use how much of your brain? Two, five percent, right? I said use what? About 10%, five to 10% of his brain. How much percentage of the brain do we use? How much do you think you use? 0.5? 100%? What do you think? 2 to 3. 2 to 3%? So, I recently watched a YouTube video which kind of makes sense. The way that they explain it is a, is a theory. It's not being proven. And this guy says that you use 1, 5, 10, 50, or up to 100% of your brain depending on the situation and depending on how you behave or how much you concentrate. You have the capacity of doing so. And he explains the different aspects and why does that happen. So I'll, I can share the video after I talked about this.
right? Which is interesting. I find interesting. So the neurons is just a minuscule part of it. The neuron is the cell, but you are a minuscule, you are a minuscule part of the whole world, the whole universe. We are. Now, what allows us to be better individuals? The surroundings. Recycling. Yes, definitely. Look, neuroglia or glia cells is what makes these neurons do better. Why? Because these are known as supporting cells. Okay? How likely is for you to become a successful individual with nobody helping you and nobody guiding you? How likely that is? It's highly unlikely. Two, three percent of the people make it without any guidance. You don't have to be smart, right? You just have to be able to be dedicated or have somebody to guide you through. Let's say, for example, you job out of school. You find somebody or some person who liked you, right? And he likes to be your mentor. This guy seems to be, or this woman seems to be a multi-billion dollar running company. And they decided they want to help you because they saw on you, I don't know, something, whatever it is, right? And then if you follow the step, most likely you will become what? Successful. Even though you drop out of school. Does that make sense? So you need somebody to guide you. And that guide, right, that support is going to from the neuroglia or glia cells. So these neuroglia or glia cells are found both on the central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system. So these glia cells are the supporting cells. And they, of course, provide any support or scaffolding to the neurons. What is support? When somebody supports you, not only emotionally, right, but also what? Physically. It doesn't mean money because neurons don't require money, but what is the money of the body? ATP, right? Without it, you won't be able to function. Now, supporting means allows it to get oxygen, nutrients, and food from the surrounding environment. If not, the neuron cannot survive. These are the glial cells, the supporting cells. So, neuroglia cells, what are they? 50% of the volume of the neuron cells, the nervous system is neuroglia cells. And this is by your book. It is still under investigation. They believe this a lot more than that on neuroglias. More than 50. But by your book, 50%. Now, what is the rate? It's about 10 to 1 glial cells to neuron ratio. These are the new publications that they're doing. This is recent, I just well, I looked at it. And by the way, that's a link, hyperlink, if you want to read more into it, okay? Whatever you see that I put here in blue. Now, neuroglia cells are divided into what? Which are the ones that are found on the periphery? Or which ones are found on what? On the center of the system. On the periphery, you only have two, which is what? Satellite cells. These satellite cells regulate oxygen and CO2. Think about it. What does a satellite does for you? You get more receptions, right? You get more channels, right? So these satellite cells pick up more oxygen and CO2. Satellites are not inside your house, right? So they're periphery. I don't know. Find a way so you can remember these things. That's how I put it together. Now, Schwann cells. Schwann cells, these are the ones that are gonna surround all axons in the periphery. And these are extremely important because they're responsible for what? Repair and myelination. We said that myelin is made out of fat, right? Since you insulate it, the electricity can travel that faster, right? So since you repair it, if you, how many of you have cut your skin, or cut your finger? Do you have any sensation after that day? It's painful. But after three or four days or a week, do you have any sensations on the cut? No, you don't. On the surrounding, you may. But on the cut, you don't. Why? Because you cut what? The nerve endings. You actually cut them, literally. But because you have the swan cells, little by little, you start getting what? The sensations back. Now, luckily, because of the strong cells, they are capable, you are capable of regenerating any connection, sensory connection on the periphery. You're not that lucky on your what? On your central nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord. 
the same function of the shrunk cells is on the, the same one of the oligodendrocytes, but this is not on the periphery, this is on the center, center nervous system. And this one, they do what? Malinate. You see, both of them do what? Malinate. So one malinates oligo on the center, the center nervous system, and shrunk on the what? Periphery. Sadly, every time you drink, every time you drink, what happens? You feel a little better, right? That's what we say. Well, that's what drunken people say. You feel tipsy, right? And that tipsy means what? Tipsy means the alcohol content went from your bloodstream and now it's entering what? Your brain. Your brain. And now, what is the food of your neurons? <laughs> alcohol, <laughs> right? Well, you don't behave like that when you're tipsy, right? But. That's alcohol. That means the high amount of alcohol in your neurons, right? If you increase the amount of alcohol in your neurons, that is a what? It's a devastating event in your neurons. You're killing your neurons, right? So luckily, your illegal endocytes are capable of doing what? Fixing that up, but not all the time. Because it's a rare event that central nervous system cells or the neurons in your central nervous system, brain is front of cord, can be recuperated, but not all the time. Why not all the time? If you are in a car accident and right, something happened to your vertebral column and you cut your vertebral column, you lacerate it, you won't walk for the rest of your life. So if a legal exercise were so good at doing so, then you actually would walk within one or three years. But we can't. So not all the time you're able to regenerate that connection. On the periphery, yes, on the center of the system, no.